Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. It's an honor and privilege to be talking amongst the stalwarts of pediatric ophthalmologist, low vision rehabilitationist, Ms. Agnes researchers and optometrists decoded. I hope you're all keeping safe and maintaining good health. So today's speakers consist of an assorted panel of elite group of professionals who have done a lot of clinical work and publications in the Stalmus. So through today's series of talks, I hope we could teach and learn from one another. Uh, so now I request Dr. Shashikan Shetty and Dr. Matt to take over from here and introduce our speakers. Just a few things. Uh, we will take questions in between and at the end based on the time. So keep them coming. For those who are unable to connect us through Zoom, it is uh, airing on YouTube. Uh, Arvind Eye Care System is the channel. Uh, it is my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Maria Theodore, who is a consultant ophthalmologist and a good friend of mine. Uh, she is from Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, since 2012. She has uh, got a very good, uh, special interest in nystagmus, and uh, she has written her PhD program, uh, which was about uh, to predict visual acuity in INS, writing computer program to predict visual acuity in INS from Great Ormond Street Hospital, London. Now she runs uh, nystagmus clinics, adults and peds, uh, and nystagmus and eye movement uh, related research alongside general pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus clinic. Welcome Dr. Maria Theodore. Uh, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Tracy Machinsky. She is an associate professor, low vision diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry and is currently the chair of low vision section. She is the World Council of Optometry Low Vision representative to the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. She has published and lectured both nationally and internationally on low vision rehabilitation. She is also the active, uh, also active in community services with volunteer optometric services to humanity. Welcome, Dr. Tracy. Dr. Matt, who is uh, who is very much associated is with us for a very long period of time, he has visited Arvind. I think thrice, twice or thrice. And uh, he is a lecturer, School of Optometry and Vision Sciences, Cardiff University, uh, Deputy Director, uh, Research Unit for Nystagmus. Welcome, Dr. Mack. And uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Maria Musaji. Uh, she's a professor of molecular ophthalmology at University College uh, London, Institute of Ophthalmology, London. She's a group leader of ophthalmic genomics and therapeutics lab at the Francis Crick Institute, London. She's a consultant ophthalmologist specializing in pediatric and adult genetic eye disease at Moorfields Eye Hospital and Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, London. She's a president of UK Genetic Eye Genetics Group. Welcome, Dr. Professor Maria. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shetty. So I will introduce uh, introduce you. So as we know, you're the head of the department um, at Arab, the Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus at Aravind Eye Hospital. And of course, you have a long-standing interest in um, nystagmus and eye movement recordings. So thank you very much for, for organizing this. Um, Lou Deloso, I'm sure, needs no introduction. Um, he's been a veteran in the field of nystagmus, um, Professor Emeritus at uh, Case Western Reserve uh, Medical in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and Director Emeritus of the Daroff Deloso Ocular Motility Laboratory, where a lot of the early studies in nystagmus have uh, come out from. Um, Dr. Deloso was educated at Brooklyn Technical, um, at Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute, and got his PhD at the University of Wyoming. Uh, is a fellow of ARVO, uh, the NANOS Society, uh, senior member of the IEEMB and WSPOS, and has many, many publications in the subject area and many, public, uh, many um, presentations to his name as well. Dr. Nadim Ali is a consultant ophthalmologist uh, in London at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, he runs his outreach clinics at St. George's Hospital nearby and is in charge of continually auditing uh, for squint surgery at Moorfields. Um, and he also mo monitors the safety of squint operations performed within the trust itself. And he has received an NHS Hero Award for his care of patients. And finally, Dr. Monisha Mohan uh, is a fellow at uh, Madurai Eye Hospital of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And we welcome her as well today. 
Okay, and Sue Ricketts actually is a friend of mine. She's uh, with us today. She's a member of the uh, Nystagris Network UK and is the current Development and Information Executive Manager uh, for Nystagris Network. Yeah, we'll start with our first presentation. I'll be talking on evaluation of patients with nystagmus. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, I'll be talking on evaluation of patients with misdiagnosis. Uh, infantile misdiagnosis syndrome, which is by the recent classification by the CMAS class uh, group of uh, physicians, who classified uh, uh, both the motor misdiagnosis and the sensory misdiagnosis, they were grouped into INS, that is infantile misdiagnosis syndrome. And with the onset of infantile nystagmus syndrome is from birth to six months of age. Uh, and most of the cases have ocular motor uh, instability. They may have, may or may not have sensory deficits. And most of the time, the stress is a very key factor which, incre help, which increases the nystagmus. So the characteristics of uh, uh, this infantile nystagmus syndrome are usually they are binocular with similar amplitude. Uh, mm -hmm. They may be horizontal or torsional, pendular or jerk. Rarely it is vertical. If you see a patient who has got a vertical component, uh, we should most probably do imaging in those patients. They are uh, gaze modulated, uh, not gaze evoked. Uh, gaze modulated nystagmus are uh, uh, that is INS, uh, fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. Uh, and gaze evoked nystagmus are the physiological uh, nystagmus. The difference between the gaze modulated and the uh, gaze evoked nystagmus is that the gaze modulated nystagmus is present in the primary position, while in the gaze evoked nystagmus is absent in the primary position. And uh, usually they will have a, a diminishing gaze null. And some of these patients may show uh, improvement or a diminishing in the amplitude of nystagmus on convergence. Uh, this is a patient who had a, a nystagmus, as you can see in this video, has got a left face turn. And so if you see this child who has got, has got binocular nystagmus with similar amplitude in both the eyes, and, uh, and you could see the left face turn. And the face turn is towards the, uh, the, the fast pace. So if you see a child with a left face turn, so most of the time he might have a left bit nystagmus. And if he has a right face turn, then it might, he might be having a right, uh, right bit instead. This is just for a, uh, a observation. They may have different this thing, but most commonly. Uh, so and uh, this I, patients with INS uh, may have a latent component. If you see a latent component, it's most probably a uh, patient who it's a uh, idiopathic infantile nystagmus syndrome. Uh, if the patients with INS with two static nulls should be examined for latent, uh, uh, that is the uh, FMNS, the fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome, or APA, that is the aperiodic alternating nystagmus. And the inversion of optic kinetic reflex, a lot of work has been done by Dr. Dell also on this uh, subject. And they found that inversion occurs in 67% of idiopathic infantile nystagmus syndrome. Uh, and may, most of these patients don't have oscillopsia because uh, the visual information sampling uh, occurs during the foveation periods and the rest are usually suppressed. So that is why, that is why there is no oscillopsia. If the patient, INS patients can also present with oscillopsia if there is a poor foveation instability. And in the extreme case uh, where the nystagmus amplitude is small and, or if they develop new field effects or new strabismus, and there are reported cases of oscillopsia developing in infantile nystagmus syndrome after trauma, head trauma. 
so head posture is uh, very uh, uh, variable in these patients uh, and it is uh, not a good uh, measure to look at the head posture in patients with the idiopathic infantile nystagmus syndrome because this head posture is under the direct control of the patient which is very unreliable because the head posture may keep on changing as the patient uh, comes to the opd to the outpatient services it depends on the stress level to the patient and it's very variable and it is difficult to measure and it is not a primary uh, problem what we are dealing with it's uh, basically an ins that is a primary problem the head posture is a secondary problem uh, so all these patients should undergo an eye uh, eye recordings uh, system to look at the nfx which will tell exactly what is the problem with the patient and uh, what we do in our opd is we uh, use the chrome to measure the head posture for uh, near and distance near we use the accommodative target and distance if the patient is cooperative we use the snellens chart uh, and uh, try ask the patient to uh, read and if the patient is uh, sometimes the patient is very uh, obvious that he he might think that we are going to measure his head posture he may not keep the head posture so those patients uh, we ask them to calculate the numbers on the head chart on the uh, sense chart so when they are calculating those numbers that induces a stress on this patient and we can get the uh, correct uh, head posture in those patients and this chrome is uh, very useful it's a cervical range of ocular motion uh, it helps in uh, measuring the head axis in all the three different gazes like the horizontal the vertical as well as in the the tilt uh, when we do a vision assessment the vision in a child patient with nystagmus might be affected both due to sensory as well as the motor deficits so what we are looking in this patient we are looking the time to see what time or what is the time taken for the patient to view the object like what we see is the gaze dependent visual acuity uh, the time dependent visual acuity the gaze acuity is very important and we are actually not looking at the monocular visual acuity the binocular visual acuity is the visual acuity of the patient and also the patients will have a null gaze uh, the null gaze straddles the neutral zone so uh, away from the null gaze the patient's visual acuity might det- uh, might deteriorate so they may have a small window of uh, uh, null gaze null point where they will have a good uh, vision uh, vision visual acuity so when we are checking visual acuity uh, in a patient who has a latent component it is always better to fog the other eye with a plus diopter lens so we are not blocking we are not completely occluding the eye we just fogging and just blurring the other eye vision uh, then it will be easy to measure the vision in the other eye and if the patient is orthophoric and uh, in those patients uh, we can try uh, 7pd base out prisms if the if the patient is pre press biopic then we add minus 1 lens because the induced accommodation which can occur in this patient and then we can check the visual acuity in these patients and if these patients if they show good visual acuity then uh, we can uh, we can prescribe them this 7 pd basal prism with a minus 1 one, uh, one diopter lens and it can be added along with the contact lens which will help to improve the vision much more better and uh, if the patient uh, re- reduces its vision uh, if the vision gets better with 7 pd basal prisms Uh, other te- other useful modalities is surgical where we can plan for a bimedial small bimedial incision steps in refraction is better always better to do uh, we should forget that the patient has got a, a, a nystagmus uh, and we should try for a retinoscopy for distance always do a binocular refraction and always fog the untested eye so that the nystagmus doesn't improve in the eye which is being tested so we always do a vision in nine gazes it is very useful because we can look at the primary gaze vision and also at the uh, other areas where you know, we can look uh, what is the null point of this patient and if the patient has, has got multiple null points so some different varieties of uh, nystagmus like it's a aperiodic alternating nystagmus you should suspect uh, if the visual acuity changes during different different types of office visits 
and it's always better to uh, observe the individual eye. You should close the one eye, and then you observe the eye, which is not being, uh, which is not occluded, and then you look for the intensity and the amplitude uh, of the nystagmus in that individual eye. If you have a different uh, changes in the uh, amplitude or change in the direction of the uh, uh, nystagmus in the individual eye. Then you should suspect uh, a periodic alternating nystagmus. In those patients, we require a larger period of periods of uh, eye movement recordings to look for the uh, change in the direction of the uh, uh, gaze amplitude as well as the direction of the nystagmus. Then there is fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome. It's most of the time uh, it is associated with strabismus, and they may have a linear or VD. VD is there. They may have a linear or decelerating uh, slow phase, and the, uh, the intensity is maximum on abduction. As you can see, that uh, uh, when the right eye is closed, uh, there is a patient develops a left bit nystagmus, and when the left eye is closed, patient develops a right bit nystagmus, and the patient has a small angle ESO uh, deviation. So they may have they may mimic two nulls. And usually, patient may present with dissociated vertical deviation with the head tilt. Smasma Newton syndrome. Uh, uh, usually, usually seen between six to twelve months of age, and they usually disappear by uh, one to two years after onset of the nystagmus. It is usually asymmetric. It is usually asymmetric, disconjugate. Uh, asymmetric. If you see the amplitude in both the uh, in the child, you see that left eye beats more compared to the right eye, uh, and they may have associated head oscillations. The head oscillations in these patients with Smasma Newton syndrome, it helps the uh, dampen the nystagmus compared to INS, which is a part of an INS, and uh, usually it is benign. and uh, there can be some uh, you have to look carefully look, uh, rule out mimickers of uh, spasma newton syndrome uh, like uh, neurodegenerative conditions uh, achromatopsia uh, congenital stationary night blindness and bardet beidel syndrome they mimic uh, they might mimic spasma newton syndrome and eye movement recordings help us to uh, uh, differentiate between all of these conditions Nystagmus blockade syndrome uh, will be there will be onset of esotropia, and patient may have pseudo abduction paralysis because when they abduct, the nystagmus tends to increase, and they induce esotropia to reduce the uh, amplitude of the nystagmus, and most of the time you might see both eyes having uh, going into eso eso deviation, and they will have phase turn towards the fixing eye, so they get the fixing eye in adduction to reduce the nystagmus. so there is a reduction of the nystagmus in adduction so what how they reduce the nystagmus they convert the high amplitude nystagmus into low amplitude fmns summary so what we are looking in patients with ins is it the vision or the head posture both are variable uh, and then what to depend on so eye movement recordings are very important so they can document the uh, variables because nafx if you do an nafx it will look into uh, the amplitude and intensity so it just gives us a variable where it will tell about the uh, it will tell us about the type of the nystagmus it will also tell us about the changing amplitude and the changing direction of gaze of nystagmus and it will help us to uh, document whether these patients will get better with the treatment and also help us to predict the visual acuity in this patients who have nystagmus thank you yeah yeah dr maria theodore will be uh, talking next so i like to invite dr maria Thank you, Dr. Shetty, um, and thank you for inviting me to participate. 
So my talk will follow on from um, Dr. Shetty's talk and it's essentially an overview of imaging and investigations in nystagmus. So when you see a child um, or even an adult with, um, with nystagmus, what you need to do in the first instance is you need to differentiate the minority that need neuroimaging, then the infantiles, so the idiopaths or the sensory from the latents. And to do this, you take a history examination, investigate appropriately, and then you consider treatment options. My talk is going to focus on the, um, on the investigations. Now, in terms of investigating pediatric nystagmus, um, in an, I, I, I guess I'm very privileged because I have access to um, a lot of investigations. Um, so in an ideal world, we would do, perform OCTs, I'm recordings, electrodiagnostic texts, genetics, and in a small minority, neuroimaging. Obviously, you need to um, modify what you take home from this talk according to what you have available. So I'm going to talk about four main groups of, um, of pediatric nystagmus, and I'm going to leave the neurology um, to Nadim to discuss later. So typical INS, atypical INS, periodic alternating nystagmus, which is a subgroup, and um, mild development nystagmus, which is also known as manifest latent nystagmus. So by typical nystagmus syndrome, this is repeating part of what Dr. Shetty has already mentioned. It rarely presents it does occasionally present at birth, but mostly within three to six months. The vision eventually is at least 624 Snellen in idiopaths, but it's much more variable in those with a visual afferent abnormality. And many of them do have delayed visual maturation. They have clinically, um, they have a conjugate pure horizontal nystagmus. And the reason I say clinically, because on IMAN recordings, many do also have a, a small vertical component and many also have a latent component. Um, they may dampen on convergence. Um, they may have a null zone where the nystagmus dampens and utilize the head posture um, to utilize, to optimize the vision. Um, they may have an associated head shake or nod, and they do quite often have with the ball astigmatism. In idiopaths, the eyes are essentially normal uh, in a normal um, systemically well infant or child. Otherwise, you, there may be associated signs or symptoms of a visual afferent abnormality. So if you see a child with INS, what do you do next? Um, well, obviously confirm the diagnosis, the investigations I'm going to discuss now, counsel and then discuss management options. I'm going to give examples of where OCT, EMRs, EDTs and genetics um, have, have been helpful in my practice. Now, so the commonest subgroup of patients that I see are those with albinism. Um, but as most of us know, albinism has the phenotype is very, very variable, even with the same genotype. Pigmentation can be variable in the skin um, and the eyes and you know, the iris trans transillumination can vary from seeing very, very little to having marked iris transillumination. The typical albinotic fundus is blonde with a small tilted disc and foveal hyperplasia, but again, you get quite the variation. Um, and in albinism, you do also need to think about systemic associations such as Hemansky padlock, um, which has easy prolonged ble bleeding and bruising and other systemic complications. So OCT, um, I perform OCT in all of my patients, whether it's a new child presenting babies if we can, or even adults that have come return to clinic after many, many years um, for diagnostic purposes. The most common abnormality I see uh, is foveal hyperplasia. I'm sure you're all familiar. This is what a normal fovea looks like. Um, and as you can see here, you don't have that foveal pit. And there are degrees of foveal hyperplasia. Um, many papers have been published on, on this. When you see somebody with foveal, an astagmus of foveal hyperplasia, um, what has been reported, idiopaths was isolated foveal hyperplasia. I think now with genetics and um, electrodiagnostic tests, we may find that they aren't true idiopaths. So top of my list is albinism, but also PAC6 mutation, SLC38A8 mutation are common causes of foveal hyperplasia and nystagmus. Um, I'm in recordings, I haven't put too much, uh, too many slides on this because um, both Matt Dunn and Lou DeLosso are going to discuss this, but they're useful for both diagnosis and also as an objective outcome measure. 
So these are just examples of a couple of Weinman recordings. The top recording is a six month old um, who was referred with conjugate horizontal nystagmus, normalized, normal ERG and VPs. And um, this child had a jerk with extended foveation and asymmetric pendular pseudocycloid, a mixture of waveforms, um, which are pathognomonic of infantile nystagmus syndromes in a paper published by um, by Ludelar so many years ago. Um, this was an adult who was referred with a, a new referral for nystagmus. And obviously I have access to IM recordings. So he also had pathognomonic waveforms, normal eyes, normal electrode diagnostics. Um, but the key thing in this, this adult, he didn't need it. In this adult, he was entirely asymptomatic. So we, we weren't expecting him to have an acquired nystagmus. This is a child, an eight-year-old Japanese boy who was referred by his optician for a new onset nystagmus and very poor vision. And even though in those unfamiliar with eye recordings, the top recording is a recording of the right eye with both eyes open and the low recording is uh, the right eye with the left eye occluded. And you can see the reason he has, he, he has poor vision is because he has a latent component to his eye to his nystagmus and has increased frequency and amplitude. Um, EDTs um, are very useful for diagnosis and in some cases can be used as an objective outcome measure. Um, because I see albinism as the commonest, commonest cause of, a uh, commonest other cause of nystagmus, um, I put an example of VPs found in albinism. So normal VPs are you will have, when you stimulate the right the right eye, you get a similar peak time and amplitude over the right and left hemisphere, and the same when you stimulate the left eye. But in albinism, um, where they typically have um, chiasmal misrouting, where you can get up to ninety percent crossover when you st stimulate the right eye, you get a much larger amplitude from the left hemisphere, and when you stimulate the left eye, you get a much larger amplitude over the right hemisphere. And this can be helpful with diagnosis. But although many people think it's pathognomonic, it's very, it's, albinism is the commonest association, but you can see chiasmal misrouting in CSNB and also <clears throat> the SLC38, <clears throat> excuse me, A8 mutation. Genetics, I'm just going to touch on because Maria is giving a talk on this. Um, I'm going to give a, some examples, a couple of examples where it's been quite helpful, although there are many more than I've mentioned here. I have two siblings under my care, a four-year-old and a one-year-old with very fair hair, very fair skin, um, both the children and the parents. There was no definite RS translunation, but the fundi were quite blonde with foveal hyperplasia, and the EDTs showed chiasma misrouting. The older child had a chin down head posture before, um, before head posture surgery, and so I think most of us here would have presumed that this was albinism, but her genetics um, confirmed that actually, in fact, it wasn't. She had the SLC38A8 mutation. Now, this is <clears throat> um, this is a mutation also an aut inherited autosomal in an autosomal recessive manner, and they commonly have foveal hyperplasia with or without chiasmal misrouting, with or without anterior segment dysgenesis. In, in my practice, they seem to appear clinically very much like albinism, but without the pigmentary changes. Um, <clears throat> genetics can also be helpful in terms of the systemic associations. Hermansky Pudlak is, um, has an albino phenotype and everybody knows about the prolonged bleeding and all, but actually there are other systemic associations that people need to be aware of. Um, and they require additional monitoring, particularly if you know what genotype they have. Um, so pulmonary fibrosis, colitis, immune deficiency. And for example, if you know that the gene mutation is one of these three here, HPS1, AP3B1, HPS4, then they're very high risk of pulmonary fibrosis. And it's recommended that they have um, chest CTs once a year after the age of 20. Um, <clears throat> atypical nystagmus syndrome is similar to typical, but you may have a vertical or torsional element. And obviously just be aware, this could be a red flag. Um, 
but it does occur in a well child with or without ocular signs. And the family history is important, particularly in consanguineous marriages for autosomal recessive conditions. The classic examples um, for presenting with atypical infantile nystagmus syndrome are achromatopsia and aniridia. So what do you do next? Confirm diagnosis, investigations, counseling and management. Um, I'm going to, so it's OCT, EMRs, EDTs and genetics or what you have available. Um, OCT is increasingly available and we, we do recommend OCT in all new presentations of, nystag of um, typical or atypical infantile nystagmus. So achromatopsia, um, the OCT can vary. You can have anything from essentially normal, um, normal-ish OCT with a continuous inner segment to the um, to much more marked changes with outer retinal atrophy and RP loss. Um, the nystagmus tends to be typically very high frequency pendular, maybe out of phase, and there's often a vertical torsional element. And the electro uh, the electrodiagnostic tests show loss of cone function. Genetics are especially uh, genetics is always important, but especially important here due to current gene therapy trials with CNG A3 and CNG B3. Periodic alternating nystagmus may be congenital or acquired. Um, the congenital has typical infantile nystagmus features with a longer cycle. The acquired acquired PAN tends to have a shorter cycle. Where you do see congenital PAN albinism is top of the list of my differentials. Um, when I see acquired, then cerebellar cord disease is top of my list of differentials. So what do you do next? Again, confirm the diagnosis. Um, you can often make the diagnosis without EMRs, but if you have access to EMRs, it's really easy to see the, the, um, the changes. The congenital, as with the um, other cases, OCT, EDTs, and genetics, for the acquired, they always need imaging. Um, so just a couple of examples. This is a child with an alternating head posture, normal eyes, and a family history of albinism in his mum's dad. Um, there were no definite clinical signs and he his EDTs had shown chiasma misrouting. Um, and you could see he had an alternating head posture, but the eye recordings, although a bit noisier in children, he was switching every two minutes from a left beating to a right beating nystagmus. This is an adult with periodic alternating nystagmus. Um, she had a definite history of acquired nystagmus and she had a cycle of 110 seconds. Again, we, the EMRs, EMRs are quite beautiful, but we, they weren't absolutely essential um, because the diagnosis was clear in her, um, but it does help as an outcome measure as well. And she had imaging, she, she was extensively investigated and the cause was um, cerebral atrophy, but oh, unknown cause. The last type I'm going to mention is manifest latent nystagmus. This is also known as fusion multifilament nystagmus syndrome. Although it's a bit of a mouthful, it's a bit more descriptive. Um, it's a conjugate horizontal nystagmus, typically early onset. And by definition, you have poor binocular function. Um, the jerk phase is, the jerk fast phase is away from the eye being covered. And you do have typical deaccelerating snow phases on eye movement recordings. In terms of investigations, you don't often need investigations, um, but there is an overlap between uh, fusion multivalent nystagmus and INS with the latent component. So that's where EMRs can be helpful. Um, where you do have fusion multivalent nystagmus, you don't need any further investigations. Um, obviously, if you have, if it's INS, you would follow the, um, the pathways I've just discussed. Um, the last couple of slides, um, neurological nystagmus, when to worry. Now these are, most of my red flag signs. Um, nystagmus presenting later, patients having constant oscillopsia, Oops, sorry about the typo. Um, this conjugate vertical and torsional, but obviously be aware of the, there are classic exceptions. Um, localizing signs, no racial and family history, neurological symptoms and signs and an unwell child. But Nadine will discuss this in a bit more detail, so I haven't spent too much time here. So in summary, most childhood nystagmus is idiopathic, or associated with visual afferent abnormality and history and examination are essential. Um, you need to investigate appropriately and safely um, according to the history and examination and what you have access to, but always be aware of the red flag signs and also systemic associations. Um, and you can always refer to OMIM 
if need be. Thank you. This was a nice talk, uh, Maria. You covered a lot of things. Uh, can we go over to Dr. Tracy Matsinski? She'll be talking on low vision rehabilitation in patients with misdiagnosis. Okay. Um, to confirm, you can see my PowerPoint. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, thank you for the invitation and greetings to everyone. And I'm gonna provide an overview of vision rehabilitation. Oops. So we have a lot of good tools um, in our approach to the evaluation of people with vision impairment from nystagmus. And these are the components of what we would do in an examination. We have to think about the history. The history comes down, you know, the interview with the patient is all about function. How are they functioning in their education, in their work, if they're retired, how, what are they doing with their hobbies? We also have to take time with this population, as we all know, to explore mental health, uh, maybe the PHQ-9, uh, but we're looking for how this vision impairment is affecting their overall life and there's, cause, because there's many interventions that we can help them with. With this population, trial frame refraction is imperative, and we have to really look at their visual function beyond visual acuity. So we have to, we'll kind of go into this in a few slides, but we're looking at many different aspects of their vision to figure out how they're functioning into their day-to-day -day life. We provide, figure out how much and provide the amount of magnification they need the assistive technology, training them with device, um, referrals for services, resources, and development of individual rehabilitation plans because every patient handles their vision impairment a little bit differently and has different needs. Um, in term of, terms of assessment, obviously most of these patients we will have come to a diagnosis early in life, so we wanna get the visual assessment done early in life. And we have lots of great tools, the preferential looking tools. And as soon as the children can recognize optotype, we can switch from LIA then to letters and numbers. And with a patient that's visually impaired, we tend to work at slightly closer distances, which is fine. Um, the other comment I'd make about acuity is it's really very functional. When you take a near visual acuity in a vision rehab exam, you're thinking about what does it take this person to be able to read, not just a visual recognition, like what size letter, what's their threshold acuity, rather what is their reading ability. Um, the MN read is very good for that. It's now on the iPad as an app, so you can very quickly figure out the reading acuity, critical print size, et cetera. Um, but again, it's mostly a functional assessment. Then it's important, um, as the previous speakers had talked about in terms of refraction, it's important to refract these patients. And when we do, um, trial frame is the best. When you look through a phoropter, the aperture can be very small. We're unable to observe the patient, where are they looking for their null point, et cetera. So in a trial frame, the aperture of the lens is much larger. We can watch vertex distances because we run into very high prescriptions. Um, we can you know, watch the patient's tendencies again for their null point and so forth. And when we refract these patients, it can be challenging as we all know. Auto refractor does a really nice job. Nothing beats retinoscopy as we all know, but auto refractor, uh, corneal topography can help with the amount of astigmatism and just different tricks, getting closer to your patient, changing the sleeve position. Um, all of these tips can help us better refract our patients and place that best correction in place. And we know we need to do that very, uh, very early on because visual development happens, you know, in the first couple of years of life. So we want to avoid any kind of amblyopic overlay. Sometimes doctors will come up with a prescription but decide not to prescribe it because, you know, the child is visually impaired and it doesn't really make a subjective difference. But or I'm sorry, it doesn't make an objective difference, but subjectively the patient notices better vision and we need to put those lenses in place again to avoid any amblyopia. 
For this objective, again, uh, we do have to remember to streamline our exams. We don't want to do plus or minus a quarter for our patients that don't see well. So as their vision is decreased, we would then present a bigger just noticeable difference so they could participate in this objective. And again, just remember that subjective improvement doesn't always reflect their objective improvement, but it's still important to prescribe those glasses for many reasons. For protection, people that are visually impaired tend to get closer to things, whether it's up close or when they're walking, they might not see a tree branch, so it can provide protection for these patients. It also gives us a platform to have, again, the polycarbonate lenses, but bifocals, UV, tint, um, so different things that can help protect our patients' vision and their eyes. Um, if you Anybody that works in pediatrics probably is aware of these Miraflex, Miraflex frames, but they're something very popular that we use in our pediatric population. And again, contact lenses. Uh, this is a pair that we use on one of our uh, achromatopsia patients with the red tint. Uh, but contact lenses are great for this population and they're absolutely not contraindicated. So um, anytime we can put people in contacts with nystagmus, we do. There is some evidence to support that you can dampen the nystagmus, maybe with the RGP over soft. Clinically, I actually see both um, dampening the nystagmus slightly so that the vision uh, is slightly better. So beyond acuity, we have to remember to touch on all the other aspects of vision because acuity is just one factor. Um, obviously, if it's just nystagmus, their contrast sensitivity is typically intact. There's not a visual field issue, but we do need to explore these, especially with some of our other conditions that have nystagmus as well. And again, we have a lot of good tools. The MARS chart is what we use typically. And then in our pre-verbal patients, we'll use the hiding Heidi. And again, to try to work really hard to get this visual information is helpful for the families, for the teacher, for early intervention, especially in those birth to three children, so that the therapist, teacher's family can work with the child to help maximize their development. Um, for color vision, obviously we use whatever the child can participate in Ishihara or HRR and we're also trying to figure out their depth perception, looking very hard for uh, strabismus, uh, looking for depth perception for the child's mobility. And then after we have fully refracted and assess their visual function, then we dive into the magnification. When we work in vision rehab, we're basically making things bigger, making it easier for the patient to see. We're increasing their retinal image size. So there's a lot of different ways we can do it. We basically have four types of magnification, relative size, which is kind of like large print, making it bigger, relative distance, bringing it closer to the patient's eyes. Transverse magnification is the magnification provided by electronic devices and apparent angular is the magnification provided by telescopes. And we use all of these in different ways or often in combination to help our patients. So we very often might put on a pair of reading glasses and enlarge the digital image. So when we approach magnification, it's not just like, let's try magnifiers until we find the one that works. Rather, it's let's do a calculation of what their equivalent power need is, meaning how big we need it on the retina. And we can determine that by what their visual abilities and visual acuity are. So it gives us a very easy path to provide the right amount of magnification uh, that will allow the reading reserve so that they can read more fluently. And then once we've determined that, we have five different types of optical magnification and electronic. And it, it's worth saying that with our world and all the technology, sometimes we start to think, and I think about this almost every day in the clinic, when do I not worry about magnifiers so much and then just present assistive technology to my patient? Um, but what's happening is that patients are using both. So we're gonna still continue to learn and teach and provide optical magnification to our patients as well as keeping on top of the assistive technology. 
Um, but when we're trying to solve our patients' needs, we, again, we have five different options, which is great. And the other thing to think about is there's never just one option that solves all your patients' needs. They might need um, a hand magnifier in a grocery store to quickly read uh, spot read price tags or the calories in a food, and then they might need an electronic magnifier at home and so forth. So it's kind of interesting to be able to fit whatever devices to your patients' needs. Microscopes are great. Microscope is basically anything you do in the spectacle plane. All of us that work with children know that the first thing that a child does to see better is they pull it closer. They use relative distance mag. So it's a very natural thing to put a child into a bifocal. It's not that we're changing too much about the system, rather, you know, if they're holding things at 10 centimeters, accommodating 10 diopters, let's put as much as we can in a bifocal to alleviate the accommodative strain on the patient. So microscopes are a very natural thing that we use, especially with children. Um, this slide is here because not only do we have to provide the magnification for the close working distance, but we also have to really think about what else is going on we're converging tremendously for our children that are binocular. Some are not obviously like patients with albinism, but if we have binocularity and we're asking them to hold it so close, uh, we have to put that base in prism to alleviate the convergence demand, command, demand that we're um, initiating by that close working distance. Handheld magnifiers, again, we have so many options that are little in their pocket, bigger with light. So we have lots of very cool options. Uh, stand magnifiers are very popular in the young children and then our older patients. The one at the top is called a dome magnifier, which is kind of like a, almost looks like a crystal ball, the equivalent power of plus eight, very popular with our younger patients. And telemicroscope. So this young man is wearing a telemicroscope and he's getting the amount of magnification, but at a longer working distance. So there are some times that we need to use a telemicroscope. And then of course our electronics. Um, and the electronics come in many different forms, very small pocket ones to computer sized. Here's an example of someone using a uh, electronic magnifier and the camera on the top left is pointed at the patient. Uh, she can point it down to do ADLs or writing. And on the bottom left, she can also point it, you know, this is in our clinic, but if she was a student, she could also point it ahead at the classroom teacher uh, or in a work environment, they could point it ahead at the meeting or whatever's going on. So electronic magnifiers are good for a lot of different things, of course, reading and writing, but also looking at distance as well. So beyond all the near and intermediate devices, we also take a look at telescopes. And this gentleman is wearing a telescope that is in a bioptic fashion. So in his straight ahead gaze, the telescope is not in his line of sight, but if he would tip his chin down, he could sight through the telescope. So he could actually be mobile in this telescope and just use it occasionally. In the US, we actually use it for driving uh, with a lot of training. There are some nuances about prescribing telescopes. There's two main kinds, a Keplerian and a Galilean, and depending on if we are having high myopes or hyperopes, we might adjust the design of the telescope. Uh, in general, Keplerian telescopes are our higher power, better quality telescopes. And we have lots of great reasons to prescribe telescopes. You know, the little girl here, she might be looking at animals in a zoo, or she might be uh, looking at a family event to see the people around. Again, the girl on the right is another bioptic. Uh, so there's, you know, telescopes can come in many different forms to help our patients. Here's one that we would just clip on to a patient's glasses. Um, say they were at a religious ceremony or a wedding and they wanted to just look for a little while and then they could take it off. So this brings us to assistive technology, which is becoming an increasingly par bigger part of our examination. Um, so here are some YouTube channels, uh, technology, as a middle-aged person, I find it more and more challenging to keep up on technology, but I try very hard and there's a lot of YouTube channels we can follow as well as our professional meetings. And again, my patients teach me every day. I always ask them what they're using so that I can store that uh, in my 
catch so that I can help other patients. But there's lots of different technologies. And in the population of people with nystagmus, this is a very visual group. So we're not gonna talk too much about the site substitution or screen readers, but this is just an overall list of the things that we think about with our patients. Again, we talked a little bit already about electronic magnification. Um, they come in different sizes. These are also in telescopes. The first generation back you know, 25 years ago was the Geordi. It's evolved over time and it's still available, but it's a headborne device uh, to provide magnification at distance. And then on the upper right, you can put it in a docking station to create a video or electronic magnifier. So one of the more popular ones these days in our clinic is the iris vision. Um, you cannot be mobile in it, but it, you know, for distance or near, it's a Samsung phone in a virtual headset. Um, and it's providing a lot of great uh, help for patients. Computers are amazing in terms of people that have vision impairments or vision impairment or blindness. So there's a lot uh, going on there. First thing a patient can do is simply look at the accessibility features within their computer operating system. And, you know, when we think about computers, it's basically speech for people that have profound vision loss or enlargement, people that are still visually access, accessing their screen, which is primarily this group with, acro, uh, with nystagmus. On the top, one of the easiest things that we tell patients if they just have a mild vision impairment is just to use control plus. Um, or control minus to make the print bigger or smaller on the screen, 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 excuse me. Zoom text is pictured here. It's one of the premier programs to provide enlargement. And I have some screenshots to show you. Uh, you can enlarge things. You can create a, a box with magnification. You can invert colors. Um, for non-visual, for people that have more profound loss, not necessarily this population of patients, but we have the screen readers, uh, JAWS. One thing I wanna call your attention to is NVDA, Non-Visual Desktop Access, which is a free program uh, that I've seen used all over the world. So there's lots of very interesting and accessible tools that we can access our computer because if you think about it, the internet and is everything, you know, using your cell phones, the internet is everything, and it's becoming easier and easier for people with vision impairment or blindness. So what is the first thing everybody reached for this morning? You know, is probably your cell phone, right? So we can do so much on our cell phones and so much more uh, for patients that are visually impaired or blind. So they're a huge tool that our patients are using. When we used to recommend technology maybe 10 years ago, the price tag was enormous. But now much of the technology um, that it's available to the general public is now available to our patients. And sometimes the price tag is nothing at all or very low. So there's so many things that we are all enjoying and using on our phones, on the computers that our patients are accessing. Down at the bottom, I highlighted, um, I would encourage you to go back and try to look at these apps on phones. Some are iPhones, some are Samsung. Um, all of them are free though. Uh, the second one down, I'm sorry, the third one down, Supervision, there's many free apps on a phone that you can download that will simply magnet create an electronic magnifier for our patients. So instead of paying four, five, 600 US dollars or a couple thousand US dollars, um, if we can't afford that or whatever, we can download a free app for a patient on their phone, which is pretty amazing. The top one, unfortunately, is only available on iPhones right now, but it's OCR, Optical Character Recognition. The Android equivalent is down at the bottom, PrismaGo. So these are OCR devices. So it will basically read it to you, which is pretty amazing. But if you have time, uh, these are great ways that we can help our patients very low cost. The second one, Vision Sim by the Braille Institute is one that I use as a teaching tool for families. And if you look at that app, it can simulate vision loss, a lot of different types of vision loss. So it's good for education of the family. So there is a commercial in the US, there's an app for that and there is. So the, you know, whether it's on a computer, a tablet or a cell phone, there's a lot of great things that we can help our patients with. Uh, technology goes 
all over the place. So even beyond computers, this is an example of a smart cane. Um, again, not a lot of our patients with nystagmus are using mobility canes. Often many of them are even driving with assistance, but just to let you be aware of this. The other thing we have to think about is we have to make things accessible. We know that we have patients with nystagmus who might have other issues, uh, fine motor communication, gross motor, and they might not be able to access uh, their devices, technology. So we do want to think about working with accessibility tools to make sure that they can interact with the technology. This is an example, if you haven't seen it, of a Dynavox, a communication board. The upper one is more simple. The bottom one becomes more complicated as a child progresses. Um, the other thing to think about is, again, making it easy for your patients. If they're hunched over something, they're not likely to use a device, but they can sit up and they can be a little bit more comfortable if we give them devices that help that, such as a reading stand. Glare control, I talked about co color contact lenses earlier, but we need to look at this with all of our patients. Um, the team yeah. approach. So the team approach is important. Once we complete an evaluation, it's not enough to just you know, say, okay, we'll see you next year. Rather, we do have to create a report to share with other people, with the ophthalmology, with the medical, with the teachers, with the orientation and mobility, the vocational rehab counselor. So we need to be able to communicate and be cooperative in helping overall with our patients. So some of my uh, just clinical pearls, I would tell you that this group of patients is very fun to work with. They're easy to work with. They respond very well to all of our devices, magnification. Um, sometimes people will say, well, I have nystagmus. I can't use contacts or I can't use, devi use devices. And that is false. They embrace, they do very well with everything. It is never a hurdle for us to provide vision rehabilitation. Uh, sometimes these patients can be fatigued more easily, easily while reading, their nystagmus can maybe increase. Um, so they, their vision gets a little blurrier, so we not wanna make sure they get more breaks. And remember, especially we get so caught up in just making things bigger and more easy, we have to think about what, are, what is their accommodation? What's their binocularity? Do they have amblyopia because they never were corrected earlier in life or they have a strabismus? So we have to remember to treat all of the other conditions beyond the vision impairment um, in our care of these patients. So I'd like to thank you for the attention and Again, this is my email if there's questions that are not addressed during um, this presentation. And again, thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, so we have some questions from the, uh, the first few talks. Um, so I'll just ask those, and this will be to any of the, the initial speakers. Uh, the first question is, how would you clinically differentiate between nystagmus blockage syndrome and latent nystagmus with an esotropia? As well as to any of our first three speakers. Dr. Maria, can you go? I'll just, I'll just re repeat the question. It's how would you clinically differentiate between nystagmus blockage syndrome and fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome with an esotropia? So they are, it's quite difficult. It's not an easy one to differentiate um, because they both, um, the nystagmus dampens on adduction and worsens on abduction. So I suppose it depends on the history, the onset. So latent nystagmus tends to be slightly later, a later onset than, um, than nystagmus blockage syndrome. Um, and the eye movement recordings will help in that scenario as well, because you will have a, you're likely to have a decelerating exponential waveform with the um, latent nystagmus, whereas you should have an um, accelerating exponential waveform with the um, the sagmus blockage syndrome but yes I agree it's not um it's not an easy one to differentiate but history um history does help in terms of onset as well thank you very much uh, maybe uh, the nystagmus uh, blockage syndrome most of the time they will have ESO uh, which and uh, later nystagmus usually they will have a dissociated vertical deviation they might have an they might have an exo or they might have an ESO 
and most of the times uh, with nystagmus brocket syndrome you might see both eyes developing esotropic the, the fixing eye might be esotropic and the, or it might induce esotropia in the other eye so you might see if the the good eye is fixing eye the other eye which is uh, it becomes esotropic develops suppression and may become amblyopia but uh, most of the time you might see the good eye uh, and you might see both eyes esotropic and also you have to look at the pupils sometimes in nystagmus brocket syndrome you might see that pupils little smaller compared to uh, latent nystagmus in patient latent nystagmus you may not the pupils will be normal but in patient with nystagmus brocket syndrome when we trying to <clears throat> they might try to accommodate and they might try to converge and you might see the pupils becoming smaller in patients with nystagmus brocket syndrome and dr maria tudor has correctly put it regarding the eye movements uh, recordings what you see to help to differentiate between uh, uh, the nystagmus brocket syndrome as well as fmns and as dr uh, dr del hoso's book mentions that the nystagmus brocket syndrome actually uh, uh, they develop a low quality fmns that has divided the nystagmus brocket syndrome into three types and dr del hoso may be able to tell us better uh and they say that uh, the nystagmus brocket syndrome uh, they develop a quality waveforms of fmns the type 1 fmns uh, dr yes, del hoso can they you have talk? to have uh, they have to have ins first yes. and then it'll either damp with the isotropia and stay ins or it'll convert to fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome if it's only a fusion maldevelopment nystagmus syndrome waveforms it's not the blockage syndrome it has to start with ins thank you um maria there's one more question directed to you from your um from your talk it's do you work up all your patients with albinism for hermatsky pudlak syndrome or do you only do that if there's a history of bruising that's now I have easy access to genetics, obviously it makes life much easier, but in all of my new patients um, or in, in patients that I've just met, I will also, I will always ask about of, um, bruising, bleeding, so if they cut, if they have a cut, does it take them a lot longer to stop bleeding, um, heavy periods in older children, prolonged bleeding, prolonged surgery, so we'll ask all those questions. If there's a Puerto Rico, if they're Puerto Rican, it's much more common. Uh, so I obviously have a lower threshold. Um, and if you have access to genetics, that obviously gives you a definitive diagnosis. If not, then you can do drugs looking for prolonged bleeding time. But if you do have a high index of suspicion, then I, where I have a high index of suspicion, then I will refer on to hematology. But yes, if you, if you have access to genetics, that does, that does cut out a lot of those bits, but um, in a practical um, practical world where you don't, this, this is what I, I would do. And this is what I did before we had access. So this questioner also asked about what would you put, um, how much of, the, of this workup involves genetics? And I suppose the answer then would be that it's pretty essential if you've got it available. If you have it, then yes, because then it also means that you can decide which ones are high risk of the other systemic complications, because we all know about the prolonged bleeding because of the, um, problems with platelet aggregation, but we don't, uh, I don't think it's common knowledge about the pulmonary fibrosis, the colitis, and the immune deficiency, which are also quite important. So if you don't have access to genetics, you do need to be aware of these, aware of these complications as well. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we're moving on to the second um, section of the talk. So I'll be talking next about um, eye tracking, just a very brief introduction to eye tracking. Um, I assume you can see my slides there, so I'll get started. So this will be a, um, a brief introduction to eye tracking. I will also talk, I'll talk about the, the main sort of classes of eye tracker, um, but I'm very aware that many people won't have eye trackers. So I'll also talk a little bit about what it is that you need to um, record about the eye movements themselves that can be done without an eye tracker as well. So without further ado, um, Nowadays, the majority of eye trackers that, um, that you'll see in research labs or in some clinics as they are beginning to be uh, to make moves towards the clinic are video based eye trackers and these essentially um, usually emit inf infrared light which is uh, picks up a reflection of the corneal reflex in the eye and also the pupil itself. And that gives a, a reasonably accurate um, estimate of the actual direction of gaze of the eyes. 
Uh, they can measure eye movements at a pretty fast sampling rate, um, which is the number of samples per second, which obviously gives us a better resolution as to what the eyes are doing. Um, systems are available um, commonly up to about 2000 Hertz these days. It's a relatively non-invasive system compared to some of the older things that were available. Um, it's quick to set up. And usually for nystagmus, you can get a, a good waveform measurement. It's, it's sufficient for what you may need to do for people with nystagmus. However, the main bugbear, I think, in the clinical assessment of nystagmus is the lack of the tracking range. And what I mean by that is that these systems are designed primarily for kind of advertising and psychological research, but things that involve people looking at a screen. And so you have a, an area of, of which you calibrate your eye tracker, um, but it doesn't deal very well with people looking outside of that area. Uh, and equally, it doesn't deal very well with people who have head turns, which is obviously quite an important thing for us as well. So if we wanted to be able to measure the null zone of nystagmus, um, we can only do that to a certain extent with a, with a video-based eye tracker. Um, another thing which it doesn't pick up on, which we may be interested in in terms of nystagmus, is torsional eye movements. So I'm sure you're aware, you know, we can move your eyes up, down, left and right, but these are always also a torsional component to that. And in nystagmus, that can sometimes be a very significant component of the nystagmus. And so we miss that with our video-based eye tracking. With the recent shift in, into you know, these being the cheaper way of doing things these days, we are missing a lot of potentially useful information. So that is worth bearing in mind if you have one of these eye trackers available to you. So to um, give a bit of history, the, the scleral search coil is um, to some extent still considered the gold standard of eye tracking. Um, it is, involves the magnetic field. The patient sits inside this magnetic field and, and smaller versions have been created these days. There are ones that sit literally inside virtual reality helmets. Um, but the typical system is, is a cube, maybe about a meter cubed. Uh, patient sits inside and wears a contact lens in, in their eye. And that contact lens is... Um, up here. I can't have it ringing. Ah. Okay. Uh, the, um, yeah, so the patient wears a contact lens. That contact lens um, can be very uncomfortable, um, but oh, I'll bring up both these pointers. So it can be very uncomfortable. It usually requires the patient to be um, using a bite bar, so they're biting onto this, uh, this stand. Um, and generally speaking, it's not considered that these things can be used for more than about 30 minutes at a time. However, it is very accurate. Uh, you can get a very high sampling rate, as high as, high as you can sample from the electromagnetic field. Um, it can be used behind closed eyes, which is something that you can't do with uh, um, most other forms. Um, and it also allows you to measure torsion because it's essentially picking up on the, the axis and orientation and position of this um, e electrode, this contact lens within the magnetic field. So it's, it's a very accurate system, but it's very invasive. It takes a long time to set up um, and it's not very comfortable for the patient. But if you want truly accurate measurements, then that's the way to go. Another one which you may see is called electrooculography. Um, this is often um, considered used as part of a, a VEP system, uh, visual evoked potentials, or even as a full EEG um, helmet setup, in which case, you know, you're usually measuring other things. And then the EOG is usually just those two electrodes around the eye and the ground electrode, which allows you to measure eye movements um, that way. This works on the basis that there is a potential difference, a voltage difference in the eye uh, from the front to the back of the eye. And so if the eye changes direction, if I just run that little animation again, you'll see that you can you get a different voltage depending on the direction that the eye is pointing. Um, it can be used again with the eyes closed and for much longer periods of time, um, so long as the electrodes don't slip. Um, but it is still a very complicated setup and it is invasive. So generally speaking, we use these um, video-based eye trackers these days. That tends to be the, the mainstay of eye tracking uh, in the modern world. So a good eye tracker would ideally be able to give you a fast sample rate. It would be able to pick up on, um, you know, if you, if you only have one sample per second, it's not going to tell you much about the stagmus, for example. And we generally suggest anything more than about 250 hertz if you want to analyze the dynamics of saccades. Uh, that, may, that may not be necessary for the majority of clinicians, um, but in research, that's what we tend to look for. Um, you want something that's going to be non-invasive because obviously in the stagmus, we're often looking at kids. Um, we want something that's got a good spatial precision. So that's the number of degrees um, you know, of, of error that the, you would expect to see. And also the temporal precision as well. So that's um, the number of samples per second, which we've said. And we also want to be able to measure the full ocular motor range. And such a thing at the moment that does all of this does not yet exist. So there's still a room, uh, room for these sort of technologies to be developed more fully. Um, but that's what we're hopefully moving towards.
So nystagmus, this is a, a typical patient with infantile nystagmus syndrome. Um, it's an idiopathic patient. Um, and this would be a clinical presentation. I'm just doing a cover test here just to demonstrate that this patient has no uh, manifest uh, ocular deviation. Um, uh, checking for a latent deviation as well. In the clinic, you're not necessarily gonna have an eye tracker available, but you can still do this. You can still have the patient look in different directions. So here we're having him look in different directions and we can look at the intensity of nystagmus. And you see when he looks to the right, there's a much less nystagmus going on there. So we can identify there being a null zone to this patient's right, um, which is a crude estimate. It's not, a, you know, it's not a recorded measurement, but it is a way of doing this in the clinic if you don't have these things available. This is the same patient we just saw. What we've done, this is a recording of their eye movements, and I'll go through in a minute what, um, what we're actually looking at in these traces. Um, and at the top, you've got the, the trace turned back into a pair of eyes, so you can see how an eye movement trace relates to the eyes themselves. In this case, the blue line represents the horizontal eye movements and the green is the vertical. And so this patient has largely horizontal nystagmus. So what are we looking at in an eye trace? Well, if you see the, um, what we've got here is a graph showing the eye position over time. So if time's going down, the eyes are drifting over to the left and jerking to the right. Drift to the left, jerk to the right. So this would be jerk right nystagmus. Um, typically, because we use paper and pages, we tend to hop, um, move these horizontally. So this is the way you tend to normally see it, where upwards um, by convention means a rightward eye movement and downwards means a leftward eye movement if you're looking at the horizontal traces. And there's a whole raft of different parameters that we can look at in the nystagmus cycle. And many of these you probably have heard of and perhaps even used. Um, not all of them are necessarily relevant, but we do like to talk about these. Um, there's other things we can infer. So we've got the length of time of the cycle. If you take the inverse of that, you've got the frequency, which is expressed in Hertz. We can also talk about the intensity of nystagmus, which is the actual amplitude, the size of the eye movements multiplied by the frequency, which gives you something in degrees per second. All various ways of measuring this. And uh, Lou Deloso will talk, I'm sure, next about um, NAFEX and NOF and various other uh, measurements that can be quite useful for tracking somebody's progress of their actual motor condition, the actual eye movements themselves over time. Uh, I won't go into too much detail on that next. I'm sure that'll be covered adequately next. So um, there are 12 classical waveforms um, as initially published in 1975 by Lou Deloso and, and Bob Daroff. Um, so these are the 12 classical waveforms. Again, I won't go into too much detail about what they mean. Suffice to say that you may find patients who express many of these different waveforms at different times. So any one waveform by itself is not diagnostic. Um, generally speaking, we find patients that have worse visual acuity will be the ones who have a more pendular-like waveform, um, but that's certainly not, uh, there are plenty of exceptions to the rule. Um, so I'll leave um, legal list to speak more on that. So what do we do if we're in the clinic and we don't have an eye tracker? Um, there was a few things that are key to make sure that you've gotten down. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about the, um, the history taking or anything else or the treatment options, just what do you need to write down when you have your patient with you? So if one thing that's very key is does the nystagmus get, get worse when you occlude um, either of the eyes? So you can make a note of that. Does the nystagmus dampen with convergence? So have your patient look towards a pen and bring that towards the nose and just have a look to see if it dampens with convergence. And then simply a case of recording the nystagmus in each of the um, gaze positions, and you can do that in nine positions. And that will give you an idea of the intensity and how it changes in the different gaze positions, which then gives you, of course, the, uh, the null zone. So you can do the best you can without an eye tracker like this. And the typical um, convention is to record the amplitude with a number of arrowheads. So this is just one system. There is another system available. This is currently the one that's used uh, in the UK. Um, and the frequency will be recorded as low, medium, or high. Again, it's not, it's not precise, but it is uh, a way of doing it in the clinic. Um, if somebody has, say, a combined both horizontal and rotary component, we can use symbols combined like that. And so I'll just give an example of this now um, and then hand over to the next speaker. So here's an example of a plot. This patient would have a medium amplitude nystagmus with a low frequency in straight ahead gaze. That's the primary position. Um, it converts to a, a slower, so sorry, a, a smaller amplitude, so a lower amplitude and low frequency in nystagmus in up and down gaze, um, and so on. And so these are the, the different um, ways that you can write things down. It's just one of many systems, but this is the one we currently use in the UK and is advised by the British and Irish Orthoptic Association. So that's really just a brief introduction to eye tracking. Um, what eye tracking is, the kind of things we can look at. Um, in nystagmus and how you might want to record things without an eye tracker. So thank you very much. Um, we'll now hand over to Lou Deloso. So if you'd like to share your screen, we'll switch you over. 
Is that working? Got you. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to talk about uh, infantile nystagmus and use of the NAFX to evaluate it, to estimate what therapy will do, and also to... Uh, is there some way to get rid of the pictures on the side? I, I, it's blocking my screen. <laughs> Um, you're the only one who can see those, but um, I'm not sure if there's a way. You may be able to just shift them by dragging the title bar, but no one else can see those, just so you know. I know, but I can't, I can't see my slide. Uh, I wish I could get rid of it, but I can't. Ah, there I did. I got rid of it. Oh, it came back. Sorry. I, I, I may have some problems with this. Okay. Um. There's probably a little button at the top of it somewhere that should minimize it at least. Uh, maybe. Uh, now it went to the bottom. Maybe it's better there. Okay. Visual acuity is a measure of three things. Optical clarity on the retina, the ability of the, of the afferent visual system to take the signal to the brain, and the oculomotor system's ability to hold the eye steady. Let's presume we can eliminate the optical problems by refraction. We still have, when you measure acuity, a sensory and a motor component. For non-oculomotor patients, best corrected visual acuity is basically a sensory measurement. For INS patients who don't have sensory deficits, it's a motor measurement. Unfortunately, for most patients, it's both. Um, hello. I'm trying to advance my slide. I don't know why it's not advancing. You may have to click on the slide itself. It's possible that it's the commands going through to Zoom instead. But I can't see the slide. Oh. Uh, it's, it went by itself. I don't know why. Um, I'm having a problem with things in front of me here that don't belong here. So in visual acuity, we're faced with the question, uh, in INS, how much is sensory and how much is motor when you put somebody in front of an eye chart? Re it requires knowing those two components if you're going to evaluate visual function. Also, evaluation of the therapeutic possibilities requires knowing the motor component. I am really having trouble because there's something in front of my screen I can't get rid of. I can't read my own screen. Uh, let me try to, that's what I gotta get rid of. <laughs> okay. What, it, what does it require to actually see well? A clear image on the fovea for about 100 milliseconds, accurate beat-to-beat -beat foveation, and little or no image motion. When all three are satisfied, we say we have high quality foveation. And I, in INS waveforms, the, eye, the eyes come to rest on the target once per cycle. Those are called foveation periods. High spatial acuity is possible only during those periods. At all of the times in the cycle, the image is either too far off the fovea or is moving at too high a velocity. Best corrected visual acuity is really foveation period quality determined, not INS amplitude, frequency, slow phase velocity, or even intensity. Those are cosmetic measures, they're not functional measures. The NAFX is a function of foveation period, time, position accuracy, and velocity stability. All of the data are thrown away. The NAFX includes all three requirements for high acuity, and it accurately predicts acuity for all patients, whether or not they have sensory deficits. Other measures that don't include all three parameters will fail to accurately reflect acuity in these patients whose significant variation may be in the missing parameter. They cannot reflect what they don't measure. Here's an output of an NAFX uh, function. The velocity is on top, the position on the next two traces. You'll see there are red data points in both. 
Those are the data points that satisfy the plus or minus velocity and position uh, requirements for high acuity. And at the bottom, the results of an algorithm which combines the two and gets rid of spurious points and identifies foveation periods. That's the only data that's used by the NAFX. So the amplitude of the nystagmus is irrelevant. If you look at normal plots, you see position and velocity traces uh, versus time. However, if you plot position versus velocity, you get what's called a phase plane. Time is now along the trajectories. And you'll see for these three cycles, there's a lot of variation. Every point along the trajectory, except when the eyes are in the foveation window, which is defined by the position and velocity uh, limits. There, there's very good overlap. If we look at these things in time, and here I'm, I'm, I'm cutting time in half, so we're half as fast as normal, position, velocity, and phase plane. And you can see there's a pause in the velocity, in the foveation window. That's the time when the eyes can see clearly at high resolution. If we slow it down even more, that pause becomes more obvious. So right in there is when high acuity is possible. Visual function as opposed to acuity has two components, static and dynamic. In static, we measure the peak acuity and the range of gaze angles where the acuity is high. Note all NAFX and acuity measures must be binocular. Other, other people have stressed that today. Dynamic measures are target acquisition, latency, and pursuit gain. Those aren't usually measured in the clinic, and therefore I'm not going to talk about them. We can deduce what is the sensory component if we know the motor component and the measured acuity, which is both. And you do a little algebra and you find out if you just take the measured acuity divided by the NAFX peak, you now have the sensory peak. The high acuity range of gaze angles is merely that range within 90% of the peak. And the LFD turns out to be the most important component of overall visual function. One might ask, why is it not measured as part of the clinical exam? Although I think Dr. Shetty did talk about gaze acuity, that's a good approach. Now, here's a plot of NAFX and visual acuity. It was designed to be a straight line and it is. That slope of that line can be adjusted and is automatically adjusted uh, for age. Now, if you had a patient whose acuity, uh, whose NAFX was 0.3 and his acuity was measured at 2200, you see it doesn't fall on that line. He obviously has a sensory defect as well as nystagmus. So you just lower the line. You now know where this, how much of the de defect in what you measured was sensory, how much is motor, and it's only the motor component that you can affect by motor therapies. Because this is a motor function, it can be used to estimate the effects of, of INS motor therapies, whatever they are. Pre-therapy numbers can be used to estimate their post-therapy counterparts. So you know before you take the knife up and do any surgery, what you should expect. Here's the 0.3 uh, NAFX should go up to 0.48. The LFD for this patient was 15 degrees. It should more than double to 31 degrees. So if we look back at our plot and we now expect to go to 0.48 and we expect the measured acuity to go from 2200 to 2070, a 186% improvement. The range of high acuity gaze angles improved just over 100%. Post therapeutic NAFX values are also accurate outcome measures. Not only can we predict the outcome once we do the surgery or whatever, we can measure them. And, and the peak and the LFD. If you just measure peak acuity, you fail to measure the most important determinant of visual function, how well you can use that acuity over the full range of gaze angles. What the patient and the parent needs to know is 
What's the peak acuity? Where is it located? And more important, how wide is that peak? Here's a curve showing how much improvement you would expect to get from surgery, the green line, contact lenses, acetazolamide, or, or convergence. You'll see convergence is the, is, is the most. Uh, contact lenses in this patient didn't do well, but it did do well in terms of the LFD, the range of gaze angles, equals surgery. Same as for acetazolamide. And again, convergence is always better if it works. Here are some curves showing how the pre-therapy curve is much more uh, sharp than the, all of the uh, therapies, contacts, prinzolamide. Prinzolamide is just topical uh, acetazolamide. It's eye drops and convergence. If you remember nothing from this talk, a picture is worth a thousand words and it's worth more than a 15 minute talk. This is it. This is what the patient with nystagmus sees. He sees fairly well in some area, here it's straight ahead, but as soon as he tries to look right or left, he's functionally blind because of the decrease in acuity. Post-therapy, we've not only improved his good zone, but we've broadened the curve so that the fall off is much less and he can now walk into a crowded room like a normal person and just look around quickly and find his friends. He doesn't have to point his head and do all kinds of machinations. What we've done by these therapies is to give them more vision as well as better vision. And it's the more which makes them really happy. Static distance visual acuity is determined by the peak and the, and the breadth of the curve. The, and the breadth of the curve is using the NAFX values at different gaze angles. Static near acuity is determined by looking at a near target. And that's important because if they damp with convergence, you might want to use that therapy because it's better. In the absence of eye movement recordings, you can approximate what we just did with the NAFX by using making only three distance acuity measures. Normally you measure at the peak. You should also measure to the left of the peak, here 15 degrees, or to the right of the peak. The 15 is arbitrary. You now have three uh, measurements, not one. Let's look at it, two patients. One has no nystagmus, one has INS. Remarkably, they both have 20-20 vision straight ahead, 1.0. Do they both have normal visual, uh, by best corrected visual acuity? Do they both have normal visual function? More importantly, would you exclude patient two from therapy considerations? I would like to suggest, and I will try to verify that, that the answer to all these questions is no. Let's look at the first patient. We measured him at zero, but if you had measured him to the left and right, he still would have 20-20 vision. And his high acuity field quality, which is the product of the acuity and the range of gaze angles, is one times 60 or 60. It's basically the area under that straight line. Now look at the person who had nystagmus and you measured him also had 20-20. Had you measured him to the right and left, you would see his, his acuity go down according to that dash curve. If you look at the 90% points, you see that the area under that curve can be approximated by the area under a, little, a, a, a vertical rectangle and a small triangle. And if you calculate that simply as 9.5, much less than 60. So this patient had neither normal acuity nor normal visual function. A more reasonable uh, picture would be this patient who has a, a lower than 2020 vision off the center. And if you calculate his uh, field acuity function, it's 4.75. You can use those numbers, the 90% numbers to predict he should go up to 19.05. Or actually, since we're using acuity rather than NAFX, it's slightly less accurate, about 17. And of course, if you can use convergence, it's even higher. I don't have time to go into the details on how this is done, but for those interested, a paper has been submitted. I thank you for your time, and I thank all my colleagues over the years.
Thank you, Dr. Lose. So uh, I think uh, Maria will now be taking questions. Is that right, Maria? Oh, from, from the last few speakers? We'll take the questions in the end, Dr. Max. Uh, we'll go to the next speaker since we're exceeding the time. Right. Okay. All right. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Maria Musaji. Um, and uh, you can begin yours now if you like. Great. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this, well, it's my afternoon over here in the UK. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you about the genetic evaluation that I undertake on children presenting with nystagmus. So um, as Maria covered, um, patients should be fully investigated and phenotyped to ensure that if they're presenting with nystagmus, this is not secondary to another condition, a neurological disease. Um, and then that's really important before you refer the patients to genetics. Now, we can appreciate that it may be difficult to undertake certain tests and get accurate results on infants. For example, OCT of the macula, we should attempt it, but we may not get good enough images due to um, <clears throat> competence of undertaking the test and the and age appropriateness. And also a lot of cases um, where we undertake electrophysiology very early on, we can't often get a good enough accurate reading when they're very small. And so often we have to repeat the test when they're slightly older. Um, and so we may not know the exact background um, to the nystagmus. From my perspective, it's really important that we undertake a detailed prenatal history. And that includes even around the time of conception, asking about environmental factors, maternal alcohol intake, any infections, any drugs that were taken around that time. And then we take a detailed family history, trying to ascertain inheritance patterns, whether it's X-linked, recessive, dominant, if there's consanguinity within the family, or are these de novo sporadic mutations that have just arisen in the individual themselves? So why is it important to get a genetic diagnosis? Well, for the patient and the family, it's important that they understand the cause of their condition. For us as clinicians, we need to know the cause so that we can also identify other disease associations, so systemic features, and then we can involve the correct MDT, uh, multidisciplinary team, so that we can reduce any comorbidities and treat the patient effectively. The patient and the family would benefit from genetic counseling, and some of these are young families, that want to go on to have more children. And so we can talk to them about their family planning options. If we look at it from more of a, a scientific point of view, unless we understand the cause of their condition, we can't go on to develop treatments for patients. And also if there are gene-based treatments that are emerging, then we want to be able to give patients access to those clinical trials and research studies. So if we see a patient in with nystagmus in clinic, which genetic tests do we undertake? So uh, in my clinic, um, Maria Theodoru is, is probably my largest referrer of patients with nystagmus, so thank you to Maria. Uh, she usually does a very good workup, but for a few patients, there are these levels of uncertainty on some of the investigations. So we undertake um, exome targeted gene panel. So this is based on a clinical exome, which means that we only look at the coding regions of the genes called the exons, these red re rectangular boxes. We don't look at the intronic regions within the genes. This is the bits between the exons. And the coding region of the genome accounts for only one to 2%. And targeted gene panels just focus on genes that are known to cause certain conditions. So for example, there are around 15 genes that are known to contribute to albinism. There are 10 genes that form the complex strabismus panel, including the FRMD7 gene, which is the most common gene known to cause X-linked uh, congenital nystagmus. 
And then genes that don't really fit into those panels, but should do, um, such as PAC6 and SLC38A8. And so these would be the complement of genes that I would request on all patients, all children at least presenting um, with nystagmus, just so that I have covered all my bases. And one of the questions earlier was about um, whether we're suspecting hermansky pudlak syndrome. And just to say that the albinism covers those genes. We also have the privilege in the UK of um, being able to access whole genome sequencing. Between 2014 and 2018, we had a big nationwide project called the 100,000 Genome Project that allowed us access to whole genome sequencing, which enables us to sequence all 3 billion bases and all 20,000 genes, including the non-coding regions of these genes. Now, the premise of this project was to integrate whole genome sequencing into our National Health Service, and we're in that transition phase where this will become routine genetic screening for any patient that presents with a rare genetic eye disease in the future. So it allows us to screen for the known genes, but it also allows us to interrogate for novel genes, and it's thought that whole genome sequencing will increase the diagnostic rate by a further 40% for patients. So what are the molecular diagnostic outcomes currently for infantile nystagmus and albinism patients? Well, we looked over a two year period at uh, families that had come through the clinic and had undertaken genetic testing, and it was a combination of targeted gene panels and whole genome sequencing. And of 25 families um, with a proband with infantile nystagmus, uh, seven patients had a positive genetic diagnosis. The majority was the FRMD7 gene, but we also saw um, uh, genetic causes, mutations in OCA2, SLC38A8, and CACNA1A. With albinism, we see a much larger proportion of patients. So we had 114 patients with albinism. And of that, 32 families received a positive diagnosis. And so again, we're looking at around a 30% molecular diagnostic rate. The majority of the albinism families had mutations in the TYR gene and then GPR143 and OCA2. And what's important by looking at these two categories is that there is overlap between the two. So although, for example, with the infantile nystagmus, we were just thinking it was just congenital nystagmus. It turned out that two of the families, one had ocular cutaneous albinism and the other had foveal hyperplasia too. And so actually you have to pre-prepare to tell the patients that their diagnosis has changed. And that's the importance of genetic counseling before these results come back to explain to the patients that we're not entirely sure what the diagnosis is and that we haven't been able to make the um, clinical diagnosis from investigations yet, but we're building up a picture as to what this could be. So I've just got a couple of cases that I just wanted to go through for you um, as, as learning examples. So this is case one, who is an 11 year old male who had a history of infantile horizontal nystagmus his best corrected visual acuity in both eyes was um, 0.2 logmar. Uh, he was found to have a pendular nystagmus, hypermetropic astigmatism. Um, his anterior segment examination was normal, his iris was normal, um, and his fundus was normal. And you can see uh, an optos fundus color image of the back of his left eye um, and the corresponding OCT showing a normal development of the fovea. The patient did have electrodiagnostics and this came back normal. There was no evidence of any intracranial misrouting. So the results from whole genome sequencing of this family, it, it was a family which had a uh, uh, the proband who had an affected uh, younger brother, uh, we found a, a hemizygous mutation in FRMD7. So this is an X-linked condition. Um, the family were found to have a splice variant that caused the disease. And when we segregated the mother, we found her as a carrier. 
Now, um, this gene causes uh, these two um, phenotypes of nystagmus, which are, are registered on OMIM. Um, and it's important that we then deliver the right uh, genetic counseling to the family. So uh, the mother is, has a 50% risk of um, passing this to um, a future son that she has, and a daughter would be a carrier. And there are reports in the literature that females can sometimes manifest uh, nystagmus. Um, and so it hasn't been denoted as X-linked dominant or recessive, but it's thought that there are genetic modifiers that contribute to whether the female carrier actually shows signs of, of nystagmus or not. So this is case two. This is um, a, a, a 10 year old male, um, a history of infantile nystagmus, but also of poor coordination. Uh, this child had a, a global developmental delay. Um, it was mild, but was notable. Um, learning difficulties and query autism spectrum disorder. Recently, the patient had uh, been complaining of increasing headaches with associated dizziness. They had an MRI brain and that was found to be normal. Uh, best corrected visual acuity with Logmar was 0.3 in each eye, um, but they were found to have a vertical downbeat nystagmus in primary gaze, and then the direction moved with whichever um, direction of gaze the patient was looking in. And they had a hypermetropic astigmatism, and again, a normal anterior segment and fundal examination. And you can see that again with a normal optos color fundus um, and uh, normal. Um, uh, foveal architecture. The patient had electrodiagnostics, again normal, no evidence of any intracranial misrouting. So there was a strong family history. Um, the, the patient had an affected younger brother and a younger sister, and the sister was only 12 months of age. Now, unfortunately, the father was no longer with the family, but the report was that the father had also suffered from attention deficit disorder, but we don't know whether or not he had um, nystagmus. So we undertook whole genome sequencing and we found a heterozygous mutation in the CACNA1A gene. And this is a, a gene that encodes a protein that is involved in voltage-gated calcium channels uh, within the brain and um, is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. And you can see that from um, the family tree. Now, mutations in this gene can cause a number of conditions, which I've listed. Um, but in this family, it was thought that they had episodic ataxia type two. Um, and interesting, a colleague of ours from Southampton, um, Dr. Jay Self and uh, Professor Andrew Lottery had reported um, patients with infantile congenital nystagmus um, who later developed ataxia and had mutations in this gene about 10 years ago. And so this patient would warrant a, a neurology referral. And so the last case I have here, um, is an interesting case, um, slightly different from the other two. Uh, this is a 24 year old female, again, has a history of infantile nystagmus. Her best corrected visual acuity is 1.0 in the right eye and 0.7 in the left eye, again with Logmar. She has a myopic astigmatism, right exotropia, a jerk nystagmus, uh, normal intraocular pressure, she shows um, a degree of foveal hyperplasia on um, OCT. And you can see the, the OCT um, under the column of the proband here. She had electrodiagnostics and the VEP did not show any evidence of any intracranial misrouting. Um, there was no family history of no and no consanguinity. And so um, we undertook uh, targeted gene panel testing, and we found that this patient had a missense mutation in the PAC6 gene, and particularly in exon 6, which is in the paired domain of the gene. And so this doesn't lead to typical aniridia, where you would see um, uh, elements of foveal hyper, uh, um, iris hyperplasia, 
um, this, this patient had a completely full and normal iris. Um, interestingly, when we segregated the parents, we found that the father also harbored, um, no, the, the father, we were querying whether one of the, the parents may be harboring one of the mutations, if this was a case of non-penetrance. And the genetic report came back that the father was not um, carrying the mutation. But when we looked at the actual genetic um, traces, which I've put in the red dotted box, you can see that there is a small peak under the father's uh, mutation. And we went on to do further testing when we actually found that the father was a mosaic and that he held 30% of mutant transcript. And so he had obviously got a germline uh, mutation in the PAC6 gene and had passed it to his daughter despite being um, normal and, and healthy. And so in this case, it's significant because um, there were other siblings within the family and we needed to check that uh, he hadn't passed anything on to them. And also for the individual, they then have a 50% chance of passing it to future children because this is a, a dominant mutation. So just to conclude, um, the future care of nystagmus patients should include genetics. Uh, diagnostic rates are increasing with the uh, increasing number of patients that we are now testing. Uh, knowing the cause is important for the families. Genetic counseling and family planning can be offered to them. In the future of whole genome, uh, genome sequencing, we can now look at pharmacogenomics, the responses of individuals to certain drug treatments, we can predict and prevent diseases, look for comorbidities and try to reduce them um, and pick up on syndromic features. And also going forwards, hopefully um, understand more about those genes and how they influence um, the development of nystagmus. And then we can hopefully develop uh, gene targeted treatments for them. So that's it from me. If any of you would like to get in touch, that's my email address um, and my Twitter account. Thank you very much. Oh, that was a very nice and extensive talk, actually, Dr. Maria Musaji. Very extensive, good. Uh, it was a very nice understanding of the genetics. Uh, now we'll invite Dr. Nadim Ali uh, to talk about the differentiation points between neurogenic as well as INS. Okay, can you um, see my presentation? Okay, so um, thank you very much, Dr. Shetty and the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, the title I was given was Neurological Nystagmus versus INS. Um, there'll be a little bit of a recap, but uh, it'll be quite a simple talk. Um, this uh, panel actually reminded me a little bit of the well-known parable of um, the six blind men who are asked to look at an elephant uh, and each of them approaches a different part of the elephant and feels it with their hands. The man at the front feels uh, a trunk and thinks it's a snake. The man at the side feels a leg and thinks it's a tree. The person at the end feels a tail and thinks it's a rope. And that's a bit like the way we approach nystagmus, especially with a panel like this, that everyone approaches it from the kind of um, the aspect that they most enjoy, the most um, they feel most comfortable with. So for some people, nystagmus is very much about recordings, and some people it's about genetics. And for me, I'm a clinical neuro-ophthalmologist. It's mainly about just deciding who might have something nasty going on in their head. So um, just for the absolute simplest possible understanding uh, of classifying nystagmus in the clinic, if you don't understand anything about eye movement recordings, and you don't understand much about genetics, um, one of the easiest way that we teach our trainees is just to look at the acuity. And we're talking here about straight ahead acuity, bearing in mind what um, Professor Delos has just reminded us. Uh, and they obviously fall into three categories. There's people with very poor vision who have a primary visual impairment, all the retinal dystrophies, optic nerve hyperplasia, aniridia, a lot of the albinos, et cetera. Uh, and those are the ones who need the OCTs and the ERGs, the VEPs, and then the genetic workup. And then you've got the the people with moderate vision, they don't normally have a problem in their life on the whole um, in terms of they can often get through schooling. 
Um, they can do sports, but yes, they have visual impairment, but it's not as bad. Um, and that's idiopathic nystagmus on the whole. And, and in many settings, they don't require any investigation at all, unless you're going to do a treatment which you then want to see an outcome for. But um, in many cases, they don't need that. And then finally, you've got the um, people with good vision, and they generally tend to be the neurological people because they have no sensory deficit whatsoever, but something in the brain has stopped working and now their eyes can't stay still and they need an MRI. So, you know, it's, it's not hard. I know that many people end up scanning almost everyone and I understand that if you don't have access to a lot of these other tests, the safest thing is to scan everyone, um, but you don't need to. So um, the title of the talk, well, I think we've covered all of this already, but just to rely, uh, recap the main points, which I use to distinguish idiopathic nystagmus from neurological. Well, generally neurological is acquired later in life. The person is aware that something new has happened to their vision. Whereas obviously with idiopathic, it's been there all the time. Um, idiopathic nystagmus on the whole, they don't complain of, of oscillopsia on the whole, although that can change over the course of their life. Whereas neurological will very often complain of oscillopsia, um, by which we mean the world is shaking. Or sometimes if it's fine, they, never, they don't describe oscillopsia, they just describe a slight blur to their vision. It's just not quite as sharp as it used to. Um, a very useful word is the word uniplanar, by which we mean that the direction of the nystagmus is the same in whichever direction of gaze you look. So uniplanar horizontal nystagmus is always horizontal in every position. That's characteristic of idiopathic nystagmus. Clinically, I'm not talking about eye movement recordings where you obviously find extra things. Whereas neurological nystagmus is very often vertical, torsional, but actually most of the ones we see are mixed. So you have different things in... Um, in different positions, it's not uniplanar, and you get a mixture of different nystagmuses in different positions. And I've got some videos of these at the end. The most important thing, though, really, is that if it's neurological, you almost always have some other neurological feature. I was asking some of my colleagues, really, there's very few people see neurological nystagmus with no other neurological features and then find something on the scan. Sure, they exist, but you very rarely find anything on the scan in those patients. Um, so a word on localization. So um, neuro neuroanatomic localization is something which neuroophthalmologists, neurologists love to talk about. Um, however, it's rather like the situation of the old style maps where you had to have a high degree of skill to kind of work out where you were going and where you were using a map and, and compasses and, and things like that. But ever since we got kind of Google Maps, um, it doesn't really matter anymore. You, you know, you can have those skills, but they're going to be trumped by the fact that you're going to do a scan, which is going to show you the problem. So I would just say to people, it doesn't really matter if you don't understand all the neuro uh, anatomical localization. It's great for teaching. It always comes up in exams. But to be honest, if you see a table like that and you want to ignore it, you can ignore it. So the commonest types of nystagmus we see in the neuroophthalmology clinic, um, well, acquired pendular nystagmus, which is often in advanced MS, actually don't often come to neuroophthalmology clinics. They tend to sit in MS clinics. And that's kind of sad because some of these people could be treated. These are one of the few cases where retrobulbar Botox is actually of use because um, you know, that will knock out people's VOR. But if someone's in a wheelchair because of MS and you patch the other eye and they've got terrible nystagmus, you can paralyze the eye and they can get some relief. Um, gaze evoked nystagmus is pretty common. We normally want to look for evidence of cerebellar signs as well. We obviously ask about drugs, um, but you know, gaze evoked, we all know it means you know, it, the, the direction is in the direction of gaze. So up and up and down and down. So most of the ones I see also have cerebellar signs of some sort. Seesaw nystagmus, so the eye is going up on one side and, and rotating. Um, you always want to check for a bitemporal hemianopia. Uh, it can be quite easy to forget about that when you see a nystagmus, although you are going to scan it. And then downbeat nystagmus, again, it's quite important to check for cerebellar signs. Ask about the symptoms of Chiari malformation, of which there are lots. One quite specific one is cough headache. So people get a, a headache when they cough. 
Um, that is quite a specific symptom for a Chiari, Chiari malformation. But as probably everyone knows, most downbeat nystagmus is actually, well, the largest group that we see, it's only a third overall, but they're about idiopathic, makes up about a third. And then we see a lot of mixed um, nystagmus, which is normally following neurosurgery, where the neurosurgeons have gone in and everything is slightly scrambled and you can't really characterize the nystagmus properly. So the other thing we see in the clinics, which is not true neurological nystagmus, but it fills up our, our clinics as well. Well, you do get occasionally patients who have idiopathic nystagmus who never knew about it and only mention, or it's only picked up when they present with something else. And that can be a bit of a, a, a conundrum when you first see them until you realize that this has probably been there all along. This is quite an important thing I wanna highlight, this thing, this thing called fatigue nystagmus or pseudo nystagmus. We see this a lot. Anything which gives you weakness of the actual muscles, so this has nothing really to do with nystagmus, gives you an appearance of nystagmus because as you try and hold the eyes in eccentric gaze, they drop down and then you try again and you drop down, you try again. So it's kind of effort related or fatigue related. And you see that in myasthenia quite a lot. You see it in CPEO and occasionally even supranuclear palsies. I've got a video of that coming up to show you. We all should know about endpoint of physiological nystagmus, but it does seem to get referred still. The key point here is there's only a couple of beats and then it dampens down. And it's quite different to gaze evoked nystagmus. One of the other ones which is quite common and tends to be over-investigated is what I call psychogenic nystagmus. I do not mean here voluntary nystagmus, the type that people do as a party trick to show people. I mean people who have some sort of psychological distress. They are somatizing, they're converting their stress into symptoms of a neurological form. They often come up with quite weird eye movements which often have nystagmus in. I'm gonna show you a video of that as well. Superior peak myokymia, uh, a pretty rare thing. It's called a telephone diagnosis meaning you should be able to diagnose it just on the telephone without seeing the patient, unilateral episodes of high frequency, shimmering of vision or blurring of vision, um, often middle-aged patients. Um, it's, uh, you know, not, it's not very common, but um, it's easy to diagnose. Flutter and opsiclonus, where the eyes are flickering very fast in flutter or going all over the place in opsiclonus, um, the main take home message there is they can occasionally be due to cancer in people over 40. So you want to think about, you know, sources of cancer elsewhere in the body, paraneoplastic syndromes, et cetera, or infections. And rather rare, but, uh, you know, it's actually rare because people miss it, is ocular palatal myoclonus, where people have a brainstem stroke. And then as part of the kind of regeneration of the pathways after that, they develop a, a nystagmoid movement of the eyes and also their soft palate moves as well. And you can, you can sometimes pick that up even by looking at their neck from the outside. So basically the examination of nystagmus is not complete with also looking inside the mouth. Right, I've got some videos I'd like to show you which will take five minutes. So let me, I'm gonna, tell me if this works. Can, can you see this screen now? The video screen? Yes. Okay. I have permission to show, to show these for educational purposes, but not for them just to be hosted permanently on the web. So the key point here, I'd like to look at what type of nystagmus you're seeing. Looking to the right, we see a bit of right beating nystagmus. Looking to the left, we have both eyes, the left beating nystagmus. Failure of adduction of the left eye. So that's like an INO. If that's an INO on right, so it's left-sided INO, he has a problem. And look at this. So now he's looking up, you see upbeating nystagmus on up gaze, not much on down gaze, but a little bit. The point there is that this man, I'm just gonna try and pause this if I can. Okay, the point there is that man had two different types of nystagmus. He had um, a gaze evoked type of nystagmus, uh, and he also had an INO, which gave a kind of abducting nystagmus, two different types of nystagmus in different positions, multifocal disease in a young man, that's going to be MS as the most likely thing in the UK. Okay, let's just carry on. Now this is a type of pseudo nystagmus in a child. You can see the left eye slightly higher than the right, which is a skew deviation. 
So looking up, look at this. It looks like a kind of vertical nystagmus. It's not actually a vertical nystagmus. That is a pseudo nystagmus because she has a problem with up gaze. And we'll show that in a second when we test our her saccades. But that's what I mean by a pseudo nystagmus due to a failure of being able to get to the, uh, the eccentric position. So now she's going to do horizontal saccades and they should be fine. Yep. So there has horizontal saccades. You can see the skew deviation on the left side. And now she's going to do vertical saccades. And you see, looking up is quite hard for her. She it doesn't actually make a saccadic movement at all, it's a slower movement. And then you get this bobbing, which looks like nystagmus. Now I've got this video I'm going to show you three times because it has about two or three beats of convergence, retraction, nystagmus, which as we all know is part of dorsal midbrain syndrome, parano syndrome. This gentleman has a pineal gland tumor. And there's also a couple of other signs if you can see carefully. He's trying to look up, he's finding it hard. Dum, 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 there are the three beats. Trying to look up. Just watch again, convergence to attraction. Dum, 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 that was it. Last time, and I'll just point out two other signs on this video. Right, the other signs here, he's got bilateral lid retraction, we call this Collier's sign, and he's got a larger pupil on this side due to pupillary dysfunction. It could be bilateral, in this case it's unilateral. These are all dorsal midbrain signs and it has this claric, cla uh, classic par um, parano syndrome. Okay, a couple more videos. This is what I mean by a mixed nystagmus, where it, also, so it looks like upbeat at the start. Not much down there. So you call, could call this like upbeat. When she goes over to the right, it seems to settle down quite a bit. But then we'll look what happens when she goes over to the left. So now I'll change to a really downbeat, a quite obvious downbeat nystagmus on left gaze. So it's completely mixed picture. Um, and that obviously you'd scan and worry about, but actually she had nothing on her scan. So, you know, sometimes you don't find things. This is an unfortunate uh, incident of somebody who got head trauma and his chiasm, his optic chiasm got sliced down the middle just by the, tra the blunt trauma shock wave. So he has a traumatic chiasmopathy. He has bitemporal hemianopia, but if you look at his eyes, you'll see he has seesaw and nystagmus. And the point here is it varies over time. So you have to wait sometimes for a while before you see it clearly. Okay, there it's more obvious now. Okay. And I'm just gonna fast forward to the next one. Seesaw nystagmus can sometimes be very fast. This is a fast seesaw nystagmus, high frequency. This is somebody who's had multiple pituitary radiotherapy. Okay, final thing. I told you about psychogenic um, nystagmus. I'm not going to say much during these eye movement videos, but I'll point out two things. But you'll see that sometimes you could think this was nystagmus when it actually isn't. So there's kind of like a convergent spasm going on at times, but without the pupil getting small. That's a, that's a convergent spasm of, of a type looking to the left, and that's why that left eye is failing to abduct. But the key point here is how often he has to take a rest. So there we have like a, a pseudo voluntary nystagmus, but look how many times he has to close his eyes. It's not easy to do this, um, whereas normal nystagmus, real nystagmus, there's no effort involved as we all know. So if somebody's always resting their eyes like this, like that, then you have to think this could be psychogenic. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my talk. Okay. Are we off the videos now? Okay.
Okay, well that that's the end, that's the end of my that, okay that that's the end of my that's the end of my talk. Um, so thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Nadim, for your very nice talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, Our fellow will do the presentation, then we can have the questions at the last. Did you want to do the questions after the last talk? Yeah, after we finish the presentation, the last presentation, then we can have the talks. Uh, we can have the questions. Dr. Manisha is next. Yeah, yeah she is next. Yes. We are going to present a small case. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, before I start, I would like to thank Dr. Shashkan Shetty, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present the case in this webinar. So I'll quickly run through my slides since we have exceeded the time. Uh, here is a six-year-old female child who had involuntary movements of both the eyes and was associated with defective vision in, since birth. She did not have any history of photophobia or nyctalopia. She was born of a non consanguineous marriage. She had a younger uh, sibling who was three months old. She did not have any similar complaints. There was no significant perinatal history, and uh, she was born out of a full-term uh, pregnancy. Her birth weight was 2 kgs. There was no history of any developmental delay. So an external examination, her uh, head posture was quite uh, dynamic. She had an alternating face turn of 10 degrees, which was measured uh, with chrome, as seen in the images. The right image shows a right face turn, and the left image shows a left face turn. So her visual acuity, her uncorrected visual acuity, which was uh, measured using the logma chart, monocularly measured 0.9, which corresponds to 20 by 160 in the since and the same on the left side of 0.9. Binocularly, she improved two lines of, uh, she had a visual acuity of 0.7. Uh, so, but she, however, we, we were not able to uh, check her nine gaze visual acuity measurements. So in orthoptic evaluation, she had a right eye 30 degrees exotropia with a prism dwarf cover test which measured the more than 50 prism diopters of alternating XT with a small dissociative vertical deviation in the right eye. Her anterior segment findings were unremarkable. Her pupils were brisk, briskly reacting and there were no iris transillumination defect noted. On nystagmus evaluation, it was a bilateral jerky conjugate aperiodic alternating nystagmus with moderate amplitude and frequency. So while she was fixing with her right eye, she had right fitting nystagmus, and while she was fixing with the left eye, she had a left fitting nystagmus. There was no obvious latent component, which was noted. Fundus uh, evaluation, it, it showed a normal optic disc color with a top disc ratio of 0.3 to 1. The vessels were of normal caliber and the background was normal. However, there was a poorly defined fovea with the absence of circumfoveal reflex and pigmentation, which was suggestive of foveal hypoplasia. She was uncooperative for, for OCT imaging. So we made a diagnosis of both eye foveal hypoplasia with APAN with exotropia. So further along, while we did her low vision assessment, she was studying in grade one in the normal school. She complained of defective vision for near and distant. So her uncorrected visual activity, as we know, was 20 by 160 in the right and the left eye. She had a compound hyperopic astigmatism of 3.50 sphere and plus 2.50 cylinder at 90, which did not improve, remained the same of 20 by 160. Similarly, in the left eye with the 2.50 sphere and 2.50 cylinder at 90, she did not have any further improvement. So with a handheld telescope of 3.25 magnification, she was able to reach up to 20 by 40 in both the eyes. For near with a plus two add, she was able to read numbers uh, at 25 centimeters and 10 and she, in, the, in the right and the left side. And with a dome magnifier of uh, 4x magnification, she was able to reach up to N6 in both the eyes. Since she was too young to use the low vision devices, we asked her to use large prints and a letter was given to the class teacher encouraging her to make seating arrangements such that uh, there was minimum glare across the, um, uh, the blackboard and we also explained her uh, approach magnification. So her color vision, which was checked with the pseudo isochromatic Ishihara star, she could identify all the plates in both the right and the left side. And her contrast sensitivity, when checked with the peli-roxin chart, measured fairly normal, measuring 1.65 both in the right and the left side. So we prescribed her flat top, uh, flat top bifocus with the lower larger segment. And uh, we started her in brinzolamide eye drops of 1% BD in both the eyes for a period of three months. 
So at three months follow up, she still had a face turn of. Uh, she presented to us with a left face turn of 10 degrees with glasses. Her visual acuity still remained the same of 20 by 160 in both the eyes. She had a, a alternating exotropia with APAN and uh, with a trial of uh, two three uh, with handheld telescope of uh, 3.25x, she was able to read 20 by 30. So when we did her eye movement recordings after the three months of uh, use of Brinzox, uh, we could note that there was a left fitting nystagmus. So here the blue color shows a slow phase, the green color shows fast phase, and the red color represents the formation period. So here we note that there is a slowly a slow accelerating slow phase, and also the uh, only the horizontal gaze is very minimal vertical component, and also a few bits of right beating nystagmus, the few breaking suckers. So the analysis showed us that uh, there were 145 foveation detected and the duration was uh, 30.6 milliseconds. The NAFAX was on the lower side measuring 0 0.20 and NOF was on the negative side measuring minus 1.86. A saccadic analysis uh, were analyzed and uh, it showed there were 235 saccades. A dominant saccadic direction was towards the left. There were 43 right saccades and 192 left saccades. So to summarize, since the patient had an exotropia with the right eye uh, dissociative vertical deviation, the features are more suggestive of uh, clini uh, clinically it was more suggestive of a fusional maldevelopmental nystagmus syndrome. While her eye movement recordings were, uh, since it was a slowly accelerating slow phase, was more in favor of uh, infantile nystagmus syndrome. We hadn't done the eye movement recording uh, before the use of Brinzox, so uh, we cannot really comment on it. But however, even after using Brinzox for three months. She had a low NAFAX measuring only 0.2. She was an ideal candidate for surgery since the NAFAX was just it was very low, measuring 0.2. Uh, however, she was not willing. So to the panel, I would now like to ask if the diagnosis given is appropriate and how best we could rehabilitate this child. Uh, Dr. Maria? Um, I in terms of um, the visual improvements, I think it probably depends also on the degree of foveal hyperplasia um, as to how much improvement we'll expect. Because if she had a marked foveal hyperplasia, then obviously parents need to be aware that the any improvement will improve the motor component of the nystagmus, but won't improve the, um, the rest. I would also look into why she has... Um, we think trying to think about why she has foveal hyperplasia. So whether you're looking at albinism, pac 6 mutation, but I think that's that could be the major limiting factor. And so you'd obviously need to be aware of that. I've also found that using brinzolamide drops, um, and it's fairly similar to Richard Hurtle's um, results when I've just um, emailed him, is that many, many of the children and adults do get an improvement in um, the waveform parameters, but this doesn't necessarily correlate with an improvement in visual acuity. Um, so it, it, it does seem to be quite variable. I've had some patients who've done really, really well on it and others that haven't. But I think in this case, it probably depends on the degree of foveal hyperplasia as to what sort of outcome you would expect. So you just need to, obviously parents, parents' expectations need to be realistic. Um, in terms of what we can do by dampening the nystagmus. I don't know if anyone else has any other. I, I think if you if you remember the curve I put up there, if you have a big sensory deficit, I don't care what you do mechanically, you can stop the eyes with a pair of forceps. If you can't see, you can't see. So that's why you're not getting uh, the equivalent improvement in acuity if a person has a big sensory deficit. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about using toric contact lenses for the I, I think contact lenses work really well actually if they're tolerated um, but again it, it's still how much improvement we get will depend on the um on the other factors like you know the foveal hyperplasia but if they do have a significant refractive error um a good fitting contact lens and previously people used hard contact lenses but actually i use lenses in because they're better tolerated and you can they can correct up the starters of astigmatism as well so for many reasons i think contact lenses give a superior correction um in children and adults with nystagmus oh a well-tolerated 
well-fitted contact lenses gives a superior collection. So worth uh, trying. Again, did, did you measure the acuity to the left and to the right with contact lenses? You might see a very big improvement in acuity on lateral gaze that you didn't have when you had no contact lenses. So and the patient I showed didn't have much of an improvement straight ahead, but looking right and left, the improvement is very marked. So I, I really would like to encourage you clinicians to start measuring people with nystagmus at least three places, the peak, a little bit left and a little bit right. And you might, you'll, you'll have a better characterization of what the person's problem is and a better characterization of what you've done after you've done it. So just measuring straight ahead and saying it didn't improve, I guess it didn't work. It might have worked quite well. That's all. Yeah, that would probably explain also why patients have a greater subjective improvement where we only have the straight ahead high contrast. It's not subjective. It is not, a, what do you call that effect? A placebo, not at all. I can yeah. tell you personally, when I put prisms on, I could see birds and trees that I could only hear before. So it's, it's real. Yeah. And Dr. Matt, are you there? questions to any other questions? There was one other question about the Sinsky procedure, um, what we think of the Sinsky procedure. Um, I'm happy to answer that unless you want to, unless you want to answer that, Dr. Shetty. You can go ahead. Okay. So the Sinsky procedure, for those that are unfamiliar with it, is essentially removal of a large part of the, um, of the horizontal rectus muscles. Um, so all you're left with is a small stump um, quite, which reinserts posteriors to the globe, and it's been um, it's been in vogue for a little while in the U.S. because Rob Lingua has restarted started doing this procedure. Now, when I read his paper, um, I I guess it's some I I hadn't realised actually that he is he is trying to do this quite carefully and very he's modified his procedure. I met Rob Lingua last year and we discussed the procedure. He presented it. He has been very careful with his pre and post assessments. Um, and is at the moment modifying the procedure with smaller groups of, of, of people. They Obviously, you would expect that they will get an, a dampening of the nystagmus, which doesn't necessarily correlate with an improvement in visual function, because, as, as Lutiloso said, it will only improve the motor elements. Um, my, obviously, my personal concerns, which may not, people may agree or disagree, Astrobismus surgeons, I'm not entirely comfortable going back into the posterior orbit um, because it's not it, it's not what I've been trained to do. Um, it, I suppose it would also concern me if there was a big bleed in the posterior orbit because the, it's very close to the um, optic nerve. It's a very irreversible procedure. Um, and he, Rob Lingo, had only presented one case of a secondary well, when, I, when we spoke to him, the of the first 10 cases, I think it was, he'd only presented one case of a secondary XT, which I was um, which I was surprised there was only one case given that. So most of the horizontal rectus muscles have improved, so have, have been removed. So um, I think personally, as a, as a conservative strabismus surgeon, um, my preference is to wait until the procedure has been modified um, until <laughs> we can think about doing it um, because it's, for me, it's far too irreversible and something that's out of my comfort zone. But I suppose we should watch this space because he, he does seem to be, when I met him, he does seem to be doing this very, very cautiously. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where he where we are with this um, in the next few years. I don't know what other struggles. I would also add, it should never be done on children. They cannot give informed consent. I don't yeah. care what the mother wants. It really is terrible. Yeah. What you can induce is so much worse than what you have to start with. I cannot find a, a justification for that approach at all. And I don't know of any scientific justification for it. If you want to stop the eyes, you can inject super glue into the muscles. I mean, that's not the object here. 
The object is to have an intact oculomotor system that can also be used to see better. I mean, I, otherwise I just don't understand. It's like taking a shotgun to remove a fly from the wall. It, it, uh, the people with INS are not that disabled. The ones that are really disabled have INS plus some very bad sensory problems. So I, I, I cannot uh, emphasize too much. I don't expect anything to come out of this research, anything. I think the problem, I, I think the problem that I've had with many parents is that they feel, they think that if they'll stop, the, if, the, if there's something to stop the nystagmus, everything yeah. will be okay. Um, yeah, give them super glue. Discussions, trying to explain that actually it won't be okay if we stop the nystagmus and um, I've, you know, I've strongly advised against it and yeah, I'm not, I don't think anyone else is doing it at the moment. And so the positive results are not, not really better than what's been done with uh, other surgeries. Rich published a big study now. We've got many, many hundreds of people now driving just with the standard surgeries or with prisms. And, and to, to risk what, what you risk when you cut off the oculomotus muscles is beyond my comprehension at all. Uh, I, I really wish Dr. Lingua would have done a postdoc somewhere with someone who knew something about nystagmus. Uh, I'm really upset with what he did with children, and I'm upset now that he's even being allowed to do it with adults. But <laughs> But the thing is, even with um, even with contact lenses and gabapentin, you can sometimes get people up to driving vision. I mean, I tend to start with a more conservative um, with refractive correction contact lenses, azot, or medication um, surgery, unless they have a large head posture, in which case surgery would move further up the list. Right. There are some options that we can try. Um, I think jumping straight into something um, so irreversible um, is not half of my deal. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure if, if the young lady we recorded uh, had been given his uh, psychological profile of how satisfied you are with your life, uh, she would have gotten a big fat zero because her life was ruined by that surgery. And she had previously been able to drive because of the TNR surgery. I don't know if it was TNR or maybe shifting plus TNR. She was very happy, but like, like some of these parents, she wanted more. And she believed that this was the end all for everything. And it, it ended it all because now her, her job is at, uh, in jeopardy and her life is ruined because of this. That's one, only one patient. It's the only one we had, we had data pre and post. Uh, and none of the data, unfortunately, that Dr. Lingua presents has anything to do with NAFX or foveation. It has to do with intensity of the nystagmus. It's all, it's all what it looks like. And of course, the, the acuity has to go up if you reduce the nystagmus, but the person can't see to, to the right or left that well. They, uh, if they could get out there, this lady we did, she couldn't even look at the target. She could not get her eyes to the target to see it. That's how bad it was. So uh, I, uh, I, I'm afraid we have a cult here. And uh, unfortunately, like many cults, you cannot talk to these people. I think we'll wind up here since we've exceeded the time. Exceeded the time. So, um, so I thank the speakers and the audience for this insightful discussion on a very less understood topic. So keep safe until we meet again in the second edition. So I would also like to uh, like to thank the audio machine unit. Uh, for helping us set up this uh, webinar. And this webinar is uh, recorded and will be available on YouTube on uh, Arvind Eye Care System. That's the YouTube channel. And uh, I apologize for not answering any of your questions. Um, we, uh, we will answer them and uh, send it to you uh, through a PDF file. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, all the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Maria Tudor, Dr. Delhoso, Dr. Madden, Dr. Maria. Musa ji, Dr. Nadeem Ali, and Dr. Tracy, I think she has left. Uh... Thanks, Elon. It's a great webinar. I think it has put a lot of insights into the 
uh, initial uh, evaluation of the nystagmus, which will be helpful for you know, surgical uh, decoding or the further management of uh, patients with nystagmus, which will be discussed in the part two of this webinar. We welcome you, all of you, for this part two, and we'll mention the, we'll announce the dates when this will be conducted. Thank you for you for organizing as well. Yeah, it. Thanks for inviting uh, inviting me out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.